Hey folks, in this video we will be providing you with an introduction to electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, or EIS for short. EIS is a very complicated subject, and one short video is not going to do the subject justice. However, if you are new to electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, and you're trying to wrap your head around some of the ideas and concepts behind the technique, this video is for you. This video is broken up into several sections. The first section, we will go over what EIS is, what are the components of the technique. We will then discuss the measurables, what data EIS generates, and then we'll discuss how that data is used. What is EIS used for? EIS is a very math-heavy subject, but we will only discuss the math to the extent that it helps us understand the broader concepts of the technique. If you want a more detailed look at the math, more detailed look at the derivations of some of the formulas, we have a full knowledge base article that I've linked in the description below that goes over the derivation of some of the formulas in EIS. Lastly, before we begin, please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. So what exactly is electrochemical impedance spectroscopy? Well, in short, EIS is a technique where a potentiostat applies a sinusoidal potential or a sinusoidal current to an electrochemical system and we measure a corresponding sinusoidal current or sinusoidal potential out. Let's take the case where I'm applying a sinusoidal potential and measuring a sinusoidal current. This is what's referred to as potentiostatic EIS. For example, if I was applying a sinusoidal current and then measuring a sinusoidal potential, that would be referred to as galvanostatic EIS. The sinusoidal potential that we are applying has several attributes. First, it's time dependent, so its potential will actually fluctuate as a function of time. It has an amplitude, which represents how big a potential we're applying, and it has an angular frequency, which is a measure of how often is the signal oscillating. The corresponding output current has the same attributes. It is a time dependent current, it has an amplitude, and it also has the same angular frequency as the input sinusoidal potential. However, the output sinusoidal current may be offset from that of the input sinusoidal potential. This offset is known as a phase shift or a phase angle. So, to reiterate, the input and output signals should have the same angular frequency, but the output signal may be offset by a phase shift or a phase angle. Now, a complete electrochemical impedance spectroscopy experiment will consist of applying a sinusoidal potential centered around a potential set point at multiple frequencies, and we are measuring the corresponding output sinusoidal current at all these different frequencies, creating a spectrum, hence the name electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. Once we have all of our input and output signals, we then take a Fourier transform of the data. This will convert all of our time data, we're moving from the time domain, into the frequency domain. So we're going from time in seconds to the inverse, which is inverse seconds, or hertz. So rather than simply plotting the current and the potential as we would normally do in a DC voltammetry experiment, we will instead calculate the ratio of the frequency dependent potential over the frequency dependent current in order to calculate the impedance. And this is analogous to Ohm's law, where in a DC circuit system, the resistance, R, is equal to the potential divided by the current. However, for an alternating current or alternating potential system, we replace R for resistance with the more generic term Z for the impedance. And this is what the impedance is. The impedance is the resistance in an alternating current or alternating potential system. We tend to get used to the DC circuit analogy and only think that resistors are the only circuit element that can create resistance. But really, anything that slows down or impedes the current from flowing has impedance. So when we take an impedance spectrum of any kind of system, we're actually collecting a lot of information and data 
about everything in that system that slows the flow of electrons, the flow of current. Now, the fast Fourier transform that we applied provides us with two measurables. We have the magnitude of the impedance, which is a ratio of the potential and current amplitudes, and we have the phase angle. So if we were to plot the magnitude of the impedance and the phase angle as a function of frequency, we would get what's known as a Bode plot, and this is one representation of the impedance data. We can also take the magnitude of the impedance and the phase angle and plot it on a polar coordinate system, where the magnitude of the impedance represents the magnitude, the amount of resistance at the center at an angle of the phase angle. But there is another mathematical representation of the same information if we convert from polar coordinates to Cartesian coordinates in the xy plane. We can actually use a little bit of trigonometry to break down the magnitude of the impedance and the phase angle into x and y coordinates. Breaking down, we actually get the impedance that is associated with the x-axis, which is referred to as the real impedance, or z-real for short, and we have the impedance associated with the y-axis, which is called the imaginary impedance. The magnitude of the impedance is broken up into the vector sum of the real and imaginary impedance, and if we were to plot the negative imaginary impedance on the y-axis, and the real impedance on the x-axis, we would get what's referred to as a Nyquist plot. And these are all of the representations of impedance data when someone does an EIS experiment. So now that you have a better understanding about what EIS is, at least conceptually, what are the components of the experiment, you might be curious about what is EIS even used for? What do we do with these Bode and these Nyquist plots? Well, in order to understand what EIS is used for, I'd like to share an analogy with you. Let's say I send you a piece of music from a symphony. You hear some beautiful music. Now, I ask you the following question. What instruments were used to record that piece of music? During the music, you can discern different types of instruments. You hear the cello, you hear the violin, you hear the flute. Sometimes they're being played on their own, sometimes they're being played together but you can hear the characteristic sound or the characteristic frequency of that individual instrument and able to tell what instrument is actually being played. Well, this is kind of how EIS works. In the symphony, we're able to use our ears to discern at different frequencies what instruments were being played. With EIS, we're again using frequency in order to deconvolute different electrochemical phenomena that occur on different timescales at different characteristic frequencies. So with electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, one of the most powerful things about the technique is that we are able to probe different electrochemical phenomena because it occurs at a characteristic frequency. This is a very important distinction because electrochemical processes can happen at the same time but occur on different time scales. So for example, the charging of the electrochemical double layer happens on the microseconds timescale, but diffusion occurs on the hundreds of milliseconds timescale. Both processes are occurring on two different time scales, but during an electrochemistry experiment, they will occur at the same time. For example, in a DC voltammetry experiment where you're applying a step potential or a linear sweep, the measured current is actually the sum of all electrochemical processes that are occurring at that time. And as a result, it can be difficult to distinguish what part of the current is associated with double layer charging or what part of the current is associated with diffusion. It's not impossible to figure it out, but it's a little bit more difficult. By contrast, with electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, because you're applying a sinusoidal perturbation at the characteristic frequency of that phenomenon, we're actually able to discern different electrochemical phenomena because they occur on different frequencies. So to relate this back to the symphony analogy, DC voltammetry is like listening to the music, and again, you're hearing some beautiful music, but you actually have a hard time telling what instruments are being played. So we're trying to describe 
these complex electrochemical phenomena with impedance from these Bode and these Nyquist plots. How do we do that? How do we learn anything about the electrochemical double layer, or solution resistance, or liquid solid junctions, or molecular diffusion? Well, we can't necessarily model the impedance of these electrochemical phenomena accurately, but we can model them conveniently. Electrical engineers and physicists have known the impedance of well-known circuit elements such as resistors, capacitors, inductors, they've known what these things are for a long time. And so while it won't necessarily be a perfect match, you could, for example, model the solution resistance as a resistor, or the electrochemical double layer as a capacitor. So while it's not a perfect model, we can ascribe these electrochemical phenomena to circuit elements, and then construct an equivalent circuit of our complex electrochemical system at least from a qualitative perspective. But EIS does more than just provide us with a qualitative description of our electrochemical system. With the power of circuit fitting and software, we're actually able to extrapolate quantitative information about the value of the solution resistance, or what is the capacitance of our electrochemical double layer, or what is the charge transfer resistance for an oxidation reduction reaction. And so, by combination of acquiring these Bode and Nyquist plots and fitting them to an equivalent circuit and modeling, we're able to qualitatively and quantitatively get a lot of information about our electrochemical system. As you can probably tell, electrochemical impedance is a very, very complicated technique. And I think for a short video, this is about as much as I'm willing to tell you. But please stay tuned for more videos from Pine Research as we talk more and more about electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. I hope that this video was helpful. I hope it helped broaden your understanding of electrochemical impedance. And with that said, thank you for watching. Please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. All right, I'll see you soon.